Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get started. Um, so, John, one of the things that uh, people in the room may or may not know uh, is that your official background, training, education, and degrees were not in software development. You're a different kind of engineer. Is that right? Yeah, what I kind of term as a real engineer. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly what all engineers would say. Yeah, that's right? what we say. We go, Software engineer isn't engineering. That's right. Uh, no, my, my background, um, I went to school. I started in mechanical and finished in civil engineering. Um, became a licensed professional engineer in the state of California um, and worked in land development and large-scale uh, civil engineering projects for about 10 years. Um, the underlying thing behind that, though, is that I have been a technology geek since I started programming in 1980. Uh, at about eight years old when I got my first computer. Um, I always loved software. I always loved computers. But um, if you think back to the 80s and the early 90s, uh, getting out of college and going to, getting out of high school and going to college, it was that I didn't want to work in a job where I was sitting at a computer all day. It's a pretty active, outdoorsy kind of guy. And I was like, do I want to go into this computer programming thing? Everybody tells me, like, you should be a computer programmer. That's the up and coming thing. And I looked at this giant CRT monitor sitting on a desk with a tower underneath it. And I went, yeah, no, that's not my career. Yeah, and the so, options in those days yeah. weren't, it was just, you're going to go work at Adobe or, or uh, Microsoft, but yeah. that's not, or Sun. But none of those were like, ooh, this is going to be engaging and interesting and entrepreneurial. So I'm just going to do this, I'm going to be working on one little bit. I'm going to be in a over cave over. under yeah. fluorescent lights all day yeah. long, and no, it wasn't my gig. Uh, engineering meant, you know, physical, tangible structures, outdoor site visits, inspections, um, while still being math, science-based, which was my thing. At some point, you picked up a camera, though. I did. Uh, I, I took a sabbatical of sorts and uh, decided I wanted to travel more because I love traveling and got hooked. And I'm like, I like that engineering thing, but I don't want to go back to working in an office where I can't travel. Um, being tied to a desk and a, a team that I worked with that I'd be physically present with. And I thought photography was a thing. Uh, love photography. Tried to make a living at it for a while. This is before everybody took their own photos with cameras, with yeah, phones. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah, it was right, right before the, the camera phone revolution. Yeah. But um, I like photography, but I didn't really like doing it as a business. So yeah. I didn't like selling it. I didn't like the jobs I had to take doing it. Um, all the power to the people who do, uh, but selling creative work was not the right fit for me. Yeah, you decided that selling web projects was so much more awesome. That's, that's amazing how karma comes back and kicks you in the butt. It's interesting because it, it was in that a photography client of mine who ran an online business, e-commerce business, needed a blog for WordPress built. Yep. And uh, that was the very first WordPress site I built. And it got me back into this, this uh, position of helping people with technology. And I really loved that aspect of it. Yeah. And there was none of that in photography. I was just taking pictures and trying to sell them and um, booking gigs. Uh, but now I was back to people who didn't understand technology, didn't understand the web, didn't understand how it worked, didn't understand usability of, of digital interfaces. Uh, and I really got a lot of joy out of like, okay, I'm helping people with the thing that I'm awesome at and they really struggle with and this is a great partnership and that's that's where I started with WordPress. You started using WordPress a long time ago. Do you remember what version it was? Uh, it was 2006 Yeah. and I think it was version 2.0 Five or six, it was something like that. Might have even been might earlier have been than that, yeah. I forget the numbers. I think I started the year before you at 1.5, so you might have been at 2.0 or 2.1. Yeah. But yeah, that's a long time ago. Yeah. And, uh, and you really did like travel. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, really like travel. Let's, how many of you like travel? Look at that. Everybody likes travel. Okay, so when you say you like travel, right, little audience participation, when you say you like travel, how many of you would define a good travel year as four weeks of travel in the year? Yeah? How many of you would be like, I would, I would die for five? Or six, right? Six, yeah, look at that. It's all the way from Nepal, and he's like, uh, I want six, right? Six, six weeks would be amazing, right? Um, John? 
if we look back over the last year or two, on average, how many weeks a year are you not at your physical home? Uh, somewhere around 45, let's say. Boom. His version of I Like Travel and our version of I Like Travel, not the same versions. <laughs> right? So yeah, We spend about two months in Southern California, which is where I grew up. Yep. Um, yeah. So you started and you started traveling mm -hmm. um, and you went Southeast Asia mm -hmm. a lot uh, and I started seeing the photos <laughs> and I'm not joking people it is John laying in a hammock with a laptop and he's like I'm working yeah. and I was really struggling to get I mean I, I'm fine with remote yeah. work and but that was remote vacation work can I get another mango smoothie <laughs> exactly so you started doing this remote work thing in a different way than other people were doing it, right? I mean, you were working, you were doing WordPress websites, you were helping customers, but you were definitely not sitting at a desk even if you were somewhere else. How did you, how did you figure out how to pull this off? Well, so this is an interesting thing. Is when I came back from the first year of travel was was hippie backpacker style travel. Took a full sabbatical, wasn't working, was doing some photography and got into that. But then when I got into the web, um, I was holed up in a family property, a cabin up in the mountains, um, and that's where I started the web development. But knowing that the photography hadn't worked out, in part because my photography clients were local, right? It was referrals, it was this business referring this other local business, it was this wedding party referring this other wedding party. Um, it's like, I can't travel because all of my referrals need me to be physically present. Um, so when I started in the web, I, I made a concerted effort to target clients who weren't physically present so that the referrals would come from, you know, Salt Lake City referring me to somebody they knew in business in Atlanta. Um, and that allowed me to say, no one knows where I am on the planet uh, and I can work from anywhere. And never once have I, well, not since the first couple months, have I met with a client in person uh, in 10 years. So you've done it for 10 years. How many customers a year, roughly, are we talking about? Dozens. Dozens. Dozens of customers every year, mm -hmm. over 10 years. So 120 to 150 different customers, almost none of whom you've met in person. No. Which means you have to figure out ways to develop trust mm -hmm. and to build that kind of authority without sitting in front of them, right? right? And one of the dynamics I think that's pretty helpful to you is that word of mouth referral, right? Oh, it shoot. passes a lot of trust and authority when one of your customers tells another one of your customers. How do you make that happen or how do you help that? Well, it's cliche, but it's always making sure your existing happy customers are happy, right? Like, as long as you leave them happy, they will refer you. And it's the case of, people ask us, like, where our leads come from. I'm like, a lot of times I don't know. Like, we, we ask, um, but a lot of the times it's, it's a friend or a referral or something like that. It's not oh, organic search. Uh, it's not Facebook ads. It's not all of the things that we counsel our customers to do because they're, they're selling a different product. But um, it's, it's making sure that you leave customers happy um, where they're like, no, I had a really good experience with Nine Seeds. That was, that was a good experience. You should go hire them. It also gets them over the pricing hurdles of being a small micro agency of like, wait, that's a lot more than I was going to pay a freelancer on Upwork. Yeah, but remember how good your friend said we were? That's right. why you're going to do it. Um, all of those things kind of come together. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you started traveling. One of the things you had to figure out was where you could co-work out of, like the, all the different places. And um, Did you have a, a strategy for how you figured out where you'd be working? Like, How do you know you don't get to a place and it doesn't have internet? You don't, but you have backup plans. So tell so, us about your backup so plans I, I, well, or your process. So the, the process is, um, one, I, Co-working spaces were just starting out 10 years ago. Uh, and so I got accustomed to using those when they're available. Cafes had Wi-Fi, that was a backup. Um, Wi-Fi at the places we were staying, which back then was largely like guest houses and hotels and things, was often iffy. Um, not so much anymore. Um, but you had a, this is my primary plan. 
co-written space. Uh, the secondary backup plan would be some cafe. And then everywhere I go, I end up buying a local SIM card. Because um, I travel mostly internationally. Um, so I buy a local SIM card for data, and that's my my, my final Fair fallback. Um, and like that happens a lot. When we're in Indonesia, it's like you just never know. Um, internet's really spotty. Infrastructure's not the best. And so we'll end up like, all right, we're just going to... We're at a cafe that has Wi-Fi, but it's so bad that the 3G cellular service is better, and so we just use that. And it, it it's really not that expensive. Um, you know, the worst I end up spending is sixty, seventy dollars a month for tethering data if I have to. Um, but most of the time, it's, it's trivial business cost. Which is awesome, given that the other kind of cost you have of living in Indonesia or uh, Southeast Asia in general is uh, fairly low. Yeah. Uh, Different if you're living in Italy for a few weeks, but yeah, we've done we've done Italy. Europe is certainly more expensive, but it's actually not that bad. the The big difference was um, until three years ago, we had a home somewhere. And uh, about two and a half years ago, we had a home somewhere. And uh, we had spent seven months out of away from home. And for those months, we had managed to sublease our house to friends who were also fellow digital nomad people. But it was actually really, we were living in Hawaii at the time. And it was shockingly hard to find anybody who wanted to come to Hawaii for two months and pay us minimal rent to live in our house. Because they were like, oh, I'd love to come for two weeks on vacation. There really aren't that many people who are like, oh yeah, I'll come hang on in Hawaii for two months while you're gone. Um, and we finally went, this is just too stressful. And we lost, you know, lost rent, so to speak, gave up. And now it's like, you know, $1,500, $2,000 a month on an Airbnb uh, is cheaper than we were paying in rent and utilities and everything else we were paying back home. So it's uh, not an expensive lifestyle we lead. Right. Um, it actually works out. Um, but yeah, Thailand, Indonesia, Bali, way cheaper. Um, you get to live like you know, royalty. So you started that all independently. You were doing your own freelancer work, and uh, uh, a guy in Vegas, mm -hmm. right? John Hawkins. John Hawkins was running Nine Seeds, and you started doing some work for him. Yeah. And you were one of the kind of regular contractors and exactly. uh, that would do work for him, and and that meant he was doing client acquisition, mm -hmm. right? At that point, and you were just like, hey, send me the work, I'll do the work, and I'll ship it back, right? Which is even even easier when you're out a nomad and doing whatever. And at some point, he asked you to join Nine Seeds, right? And uh, and then a little past that, right? He asked you to become a partner in Nine Seeds, right? And you took on more legitimate responsibility. You were helping the business. You were helping shaping process and procedure. Um, and then. He decided he wanted out. Yep. And so you bought the business from him or took it over, right? Um, tell us about that process because it's an incredibly interesting dynamic of going from you're a contractor who's doing some work to you're a partner in the business to it's now your business and the founder is out. Uh, yeah, so that. Uh is very accurate. Um, I had started freelancing. John, I don't, I don't lie on stage. No, you don't. You don't. Uh, <laughs> I had found what accurate. was called at the time J Brown Studios, which was originally photography shifted into web. And uh, at that point, I, w I was contracting for John and loved the team that worked for Nine Seeds. I was like, happy to work with you guys. This is awesome. I don't have to acquire my own work. Uh, I can do you know 40 hours of development a week instead of 20 hours of development a week and 20 hours trying to sell it and manage it and everything else. Um, it was a great match. Uh, and then after about a year and a half of that, I said, this is a great match, but I have no job security. Like, I'm a contractor for this agency and it's working out well, but where am I in five years if I just keep doing this? Uh, and so I told John, I'm like, I, I want a stake in it or I'm going to go back and build my own agency. Um, and yeah, bought in as a partner uh, and that went great. Um, and then John decided he wanted to get out of WordPress. 
uh, he got an offer from a startup, which we had actually talked about in the acquisition deal. It was like, we all work in tech. We all dream of like the startup being like, here's fat stacks of cash. Uh, none of us wanted to be handcuffed to saying no to that. Uh, and so he went and worked for a startup for a while. Um, and I took over the thing. And uh, it's been good. It's been a wild ride. Uh, one of the... One of the details about um, working with John was that he had great people skills, both client and kind of HR in-house people skills, which I did not. Um, I was an engineer. I was a project manager. I ran teams, but it was very technical. Um, and uh, so there was a, a great pairing there. And compensating for that has been uh, probably the biggest business challenge for the last few years. And it's where I, I spend all my time thinking and working on and fixing is, is that side of it. Um, the technical side and building stuff, that's all, that's all easy, the tech side of it. So. Awesome. So now you're running nine seats, uh, and you recently acquired another part of someone else's business, <laughs> right? I mean, like, yeah. like everything that a person could go through in terms of agency life, you're going through, right? Yeah. So you've contracted, you've bought in, you've been a partner, you've now taken it over, and now you went and bought someone else's part of their business. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about the deal you did with, uh, we yeah, Web Savvy Designs. So. Uh, uh, this woman uh, in the WordPress community, Rebecca Gill, fantastic, amazing businesswoman, um, had built an agency. And part of that, uh, through one of her developers, had built a theme store. And Rebecca and I got to know each other and felt comfortable. And uh, I was talking to her about, like, yeah, you know, Nine Seeds has always had a couple of products that were WordPress plugins we sold, but they were very minor, like, they barely hit the bottom line. But. Um, but we thought about building some themes, and she's like, really? Because I have a bunch of themes, and I'm kind of tired of building and supporting them. Because her key developer yeah. who had, her key developer had literally dragged her into the theme business. Yes. Right? She had said, no, no. He built themes. He built the store. He put it out there. People started buying it, and then she went, oh my gosh. But eventually, he left. Yeah. He left. And she's sitting there holding that store. And for a couple years, she tried to figure out how to make it work. Right. And I'm like, well, I, I have a team that's perfectly fit for these Genesis child themes. Um, let's figure out a, a business arrangement that works. And, uh, and yeah, transfer that half of her business so that she can focus exclusively on consulting and SEO work, which was her focus, because um, she'd lost her senior developer who'd been doing this theme development work. Um, and we took over the support and then took over the entire store and all the, the themes and have new themes coming out very soon. Uh, those were supposed to be out a couple months ago, and then we kind of went, let's make sure the foundation works for Gutenberg, because now everything has to be Gutenberg. Um, which is a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it, it there's still enough uncertainty there that it's not like we can just be like, this will work in six months when Gutenberg comes out. We want to be sure that that's that's solid. Yeah. Um, that means you're a company that is both a services business and a product business. Yeah, everybody says that's a bad idea. I normally tell everybody that's a <laughs> horrid idea. Like you cannot do that well. But um, tell us how how that's been or how it's going, and and what are the uh, things you're seeing? It is not utopia, but it's not bad. It was a, a consciously made decision, right? Like what you hear from all of the product slash service back and forth businesses is services tends to always be on fire, and you never have the the extra bandwidth to go send off to the product side of the business, which isn't on fire and burning. Um, and so there's this, this constant push and pull of resources, right? Yeah. So we had pretty much intended and did set up a firewall. Um, I had two people who had worked as, for us as contractors for a long time and went, you guys are just going to be doing themes. Uh, the client service people are still going to be doing client service work. And if they get time, which they never have, uh, they're going to be doing some product and support work and stuff. So there is the ability to cross over. But you're not doing a crossover. It means you're really running two companies. Yeah. 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 Which is the only way it really works. I, I don't disagree with that. Oh, that's good. So uh, you're running both. You're running a product company and a services company. Uh, you have to. John's not there, so John's not pulling in new customers, right? So how do you? Uh, obviously, on the services side, you have a whole lot of wealth of customers, and so they're recommending whatever. How do you drive business on the product side? That's a good question, Chris. 
things. We uh, we need to do more marketing on that side because the the theme business has only been ours for for six months, really, kind of more like three. Um, and I'm just starting to figure out the the SEO stuff that Rebecca had put in place still is paying off. That's huge. Um, but we need to start doing more active marketing, which is not something we've ever had to do for the client service side. Yeah. So as you put it, like yeah, I get to do it all now because once I'd kind of figured out how to run the services business, now it's like now figure out how to run a product business where you actually have to market and sell and get in front of people's faces and you know do split testing on sales pages and all that. So um, I'm definitely not an expert at that yet, but I love the new challenges. So. Coming along. How how big is Nine Seeds right now? Five. Okay. Yeah. Six. Six, assuming the hire I just talked to the other day actually signs. That's nice. <laughs> so with six, and you have two of them doing the product side, and then you have four of them doing on the right, or three in the service side, plus you yeah. running both, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a pretty small organization. Um, I take it they're not all sitting in the same location, right? None of them are sitting in the same location. So how do you help all of them stay connected, mm. interact with each other, and work well together? Man, have we been through everything. We, we used to joke years ago at Nine Seeds with, with John that we, we would be better equipped as like software testing of project management tools because <laughs> we went through every single one, like from Basecamp to Basecamp 2 to Trello to Asana to Redbooth to Jira to... One thing they don't know is that John created his own. Yeah. Somewhere in that process of testing like 32 different task management systems, I got an email saying, hey, can you test this? And I'm like, what is it? He goes, we built our own... And I'm like, don't, don't finish that sentence, right? <laughs> but so that's what he had done. Scratching your own itch with yeah. eating the dog food and yeah, it was a time tracking invoicing system. Uh, which is still for sale. <laughs> we don't use. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, so we've been through all the tools. Slack is our primary communication tool these days. Um, uh, project management in general, internally, is in Asana. Um, we had left Asana, then we came back to Asana because we missed it. Now we're like, eh, do we really miss it? <laughs> uh, and we just started using something I think you're familiar from your days at Crowd Favorite, Sifter app, mm -hmm. for um, client-facing issue and bug tracking, which is great. Um, but structurally, just we, don't try and integrate that with with uh, GitHub at all. Oh god. No. Um, <laughs> But in terms of the, the team building side of it, which is really critically important, um, we are not agile based. We're too small for agile, right? Like our project ends up waterfall whether we want it to or not. Um, but we do daily stand ups. Um, and we've tried to reduce those down to not be daily, but we do a daily half hour call in the morning, uh, West Coast time. Um, and really quickly hit what projects are, are going on, what tasks have to go. Um, we use kind of the L10 spreadsheet kind of thing for it, or, or list. And um, that is a uh, video call on Google Hangouts. Uh, occasionally people start turning their cameras off and I start telling them they can't. Um, because face-to-face -face visuals is super important. Um, if, if I see your camera off like three or four days in a row, I'm like, turn it back on. I consulted with a I consulted with a very very well known and very large and highly revenue producing WordPress company uh, a year and a half ago, uh, almost two, and uh, and I instituted daily calls. I was helping them with their engineering team, and I, I instituted daily calls, and I instituted that they all had to have their camera on, mm -hmm. and uh, and the, the their manager right really didn't like being on a camera, and therefore he wanted to not have the team be on the camera and. So Nope, everyone's got to be on the camera. And then, uh, and then I, I gave them some assignment, right? Read this, do this, whatever. I don't even remember what the assignment was. It wasn't a big deal. Um, but then two days later, we were on the video call, and I asked them if they had done it. And I knew exactly who had and hadn't before they said a word, right? Because you can watch their face. Oh, I'm, I'm looking somewhere. I don't make eye contact with the camera, right? And you're like, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you did, you did, you didn't. One guy's like, I'm ready for you to ask me this question. Um, I've got my homework. It's amazing how video helps, right? Because it's, it's all that nonverbal communication that still comes through on video that doesn't when you're on a phone call. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's all of it. And it, 
People who see each other once a day uh, feel way more comfortable reaching out about problems, help, you know, troubleshooting, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, having that daily face time, even if it's just a few minutes, makes a huge difference. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, how do you recruit? I mean, you just said you were just hiring someone, right? So how do you how do you evaluate and recruit people to join the team? Um, so that's a good question because that's that's kind of the challenge I'm I'm having right now is hiring has become more difficult for us. Um, years ago, we would hiring is difficult for, difficult for everyone. Everyone. Um, we used to hire largely from work camps. Um, and the primary reason for that was um, we were all going to a lot of word camps, um, lots, uh, and you would find people who were young, energetic, not that older people can't be energetic, uh, and committed and passionate about WordPress. And those people made great employees. Like they were excited. Plus they didn't think they were worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Right. Now those same people have been in the WordPress community for eight years, and they think they're worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, but they're not actually like computer science trained yeah. software engineers. I can't believe I use that word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, they're experienced WordPress devs, but they don't understand object oriented program. They don't have, know how to use Node or Gulp or all of these tools that we're all using now. Um, and so there's this there's this problem. It's like I need to find those those technically competent, not necessarily. We used to be like you have to know WordPress if you want to work for us because it's all we do. We are a 100% WordPress focused agency. Um, I think in the what we're at nine years now, eight years, eight years. Uh, we have done three projects that weren't WordPress focused. We migrate all sorts of things: ASP.NET, Blogger, all this stuff into WordPress. But we've only done three things that are like pure PHP projects outside of WordPress. Um, but anyway, to, to the hiring point, um, it's a challenge. I'm starting to look more at things like remote work jobs and posting, collecting resumes. That's that's currently my big business challenge. So I, I, I don't have a great answer. Yeah. No, we've seen it again in six months. We, we see it all the time, right? I saw it when I was a crowd favorite. I see it at the web. See, it's it's that. You have people that now have eight years experience, but in reality, they kind of have two years experience four times over. And so that doesn't actually equal the, the, the revenue they want for an eight year experience. Uh, but also it doesn't have what I, what I need if I'm hiring a senior person at that price point. And half the time, I, I don't need that price point or that se senior, I need something different, but it just gets harder and harder, right? And so. And I think the WordPress space is, I don't know if it's different. You, you have all the software experience outside, but like there's a lot of people I see looking for a job every six months. I'm like, I don't necessarily want to hire those people. So Indeed, the company that does uh, job uh, boards, right, um, spoke at a conference last year that I was at, and they said that the average person posts their resume uh, looking for new jobs within two days of being hired at their new job. And you're like, mind-boggling. What? Right? Um, those of us who are a little more mature in life, right? We're like, no, no, no. You took you took a job, right? Like, take your name off the off the market and focus, and it's going to be a couple years, and you got to deliver value, and you, you got to grow into the and and that's not the case, right? Indeed's going, oh no, no, no. They just got the job, and within two days, they're like, yeah, just in case something else pops up, and you're like, oh my goodness, right? Um, it also changes the nature. I, I'm still running a pretty good track record. I think the average is still now it's come down from about six to about four and a half years. Uh, the a length of time someone stays working for me, but it's coming down, right? Because people are like, oh, I'm just, I just want to try something new, right? It doesn't matter if their job is great and they're doing good stuff. They're just like, yeah, but I'm doing the stuff that I've been doing and I want to go. Yeah, I don't expect anybody to work for us for life. Right. Like it's, we're not in the 50s, right? Like it, the, the marketplace has changed for labor. Um, but you kind of expect a couple of years. Like, yeah. And it's one of the things I talk about when I interview people. I'm like, well, what do you want to be doing in a year or two? And it, it, They're like Rails. The right answer is not like, <laughs> oh, I want to get into Rails or Rust. Or like, yeah. I want to be doing machine learning. Yeah. yeah like, oh. Why are you telling me this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, 
like I love having long-term plans for the people who work for us. Like yeah. that's really important because I try to fulfill those. Like yeah. I think that people work best when they're when they're following their passion and they're on the track they want to be on. Um, and you can't always be 100 percent on that. Like sometimes you got to get the job done. But but. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, like, this person said they want to go into, you know, React. I'm going to find jobs that I can put yep. them into that yep. because I know that that's where they're going to excel. Because um, you got to you got to kind of follow that passion and ride that. So we have uh, time for one or two questions for John. Anybody have something? Yeah. If someone was transitioning into becoming a WordPress developer, what would you say they should focus on first to become the so that's a great question. It's the whole someone's doing. They've been doing other stuff somewhere else. They're transitioning into WordPress, right? How would you recommend that they do that? Um, if you're working freelance and you have jobs, or are you just trying to? I don't know. That I have an answer for this. Like this is a question I probably used to answer really casually. Um, <laughs> Start building sites. Um, like, learn PHP. You've got to know PHP if you're going to touch WordPress. Um, but you can learn PHP by tinkering. Yeah, you right? can like learn. The PHP is a, a, a very simple language, yeah. um, at least at the functional side. When you get into object oriented, it gets more complicated. But, um, but you can learn it on your own. Like, 90% of the people, made up number, uh, in the WordPress space are self taught. Um, Nothing about PHP, JavaScript, uh, CSS is requires formal education to learn uh, beyond knowing how to Google for results. Um, if you're looking for your first jobs, um, find people willing to hire you knowing that you're inexperienced. Um, I tell people the very first job I had was for a photography client. Um, I think I charged them 20 bucks an hour. Uh, this is 10 years ago. I built a floating share bar because he'd seen one on Mashable back in the day. Yeah. I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. I want that. And I was like, I think I can figure that out Like, and figured it out and then just started doubling my rates on new clients. Um, I think one of the other things to note is, first, be honest about what you know and don't know, right? Because the right kind of employer who's hiring will see the other things you do know and if those are valuable enough it's worth paying for that while helping you grow helping anyone grow in the others right so everyone's bringing some value to the table even if it's not I write this PHP code but I've done this kind of project or I've worked with this kind of client or I know this domain expertise so make sure you're able to articulate what you do bring to the table, right? And the second piece is, um, it was, so number one, be honest, right? Number two in that, be articulate about what you bring to the table. And number three is plan on doing a lot of rote grunt work, right? The only way you get comfortable with something is doing it over and over and over again, because then you start determining what's normative and what's outside of bounds, right? When you've only done it once or twice, you don't know if what you did was totally standard or what you did was kind of crazy and nuanced, right? So just plan on doing a lot. Yeah. Let's give it up for John. We're going to take a couple minute break and then we'll be right back at it.